The music and dance hides so much. For a moment, their troubles are behind them. This is one of the best times in school. A majority of the children are deaf and blind or have a deteriorating sight or hearing. This is how the day starts at the Cabernet School for the Deaf Blind. It's the only one in East and Central Africa. Most of them come without anything. So we just receive them. You cannot send them home like uh, other schools. <laughs> I'm a mother of a special child. I have a son here in this school. Emmanuel, um, apart from the fact that he doesn't have sight, he also doesn't have speech. Before that, Emmanuel had attended several other schools, but he could never get any help. Up to the time before he came to this school, we used to do literally everything for him, like even feeding him you know, bathing him and everything. For Emmanuel's mother, that glimpse of hope of nurturing Emmanuel into an independent man could only be found here. We help Emmanuel. Tomorrow will be old. What's going to happen to him? We felt this boy needed to be independent. After just one term in school, he could move around from the dormitory to the dining hall. This was a major milestone. We took Emmanuel to many schools. But what Emmanuel gained in just one single term was never, not even a bit of it was gained in any of the other schools. My hope is that uh, when in future Emmanuel is going to be independent, he'll do things for himself, he'll be able to earn a living for himself, he'll even be able to have a family, he'll be able to, I'm seeing a great man in Emmanuel. But as a mother, she can only hope for so much. She needs the school to actualize her hopes and dreams. We have really struggled to make ends meet. We really uh, have to be very, you know, economical in terms of, you know, sharing between salaries and, um, and the workers' salary. It's a struggle to learn the basics of life, but a greater struggle is behind the smiles. These kids actually come to school without uh, paying school fees. We charge them uh, 5,500 shillings. Parents of these uh, kids don't believe in paying school fees. They believe that these children are actually property of the government. <laughs> The struggles to sustain the system and the children is mainly due to the inconsistent funding. The grants from government that make survival here a one day at a time affair. Take last year, for example. For six months, the school did not get the grant, forcing the non-teaching staff to stage a go slow. You know, these people, uh, it's like they have a calling, eh? So when you tell them, look here, assist this child, they, they would always come. Uh, but inside them, of course, they knew something was wrong. Uh, they needed money for their children. School was... Right, that's just an excerpt of uh, that special feature by Masi Kandie, the special neglect. And to discuss this, I'm joined by two guests. We have uh, one, Dr. Lynette Ongera, a senior officer at the Kenya Institute of Special Education. She's actually the deputy academics registrar. Uh, welcome, uh, Lynette. And then we have Grace Njambi, who is the head of department of the intellectual disability uh, within the same institution, that is the Kenya Institute of Special Education. And of course, uh, my colleague, who went to the same school, by the way, Masi Kandie. <laughs> Thank you for that very informative feature. Of, I unfortunately couldn't run uh, the entire piece. But um, just to start with you, um, Dr. Ongera, uh, talking about, uh, because we have just heard from that excerpt that the main challenge is as far as getting the resources to support these, uh, these children. Because uh, from the same story by Masik and yeah, we see that uh, 250 million shillings was disbursed in the financial year 2016-2017. And this went to 2,820 uh, 2, schools uh, affecting about 106,000 learners. 
so if you look at that um, calculation, 250 million shillings is uh, quite little for uh, supporting uh, such kind of uh, uh, children. You work at the Kenya Institute of Special Education, so you really understand uh, matters that affect these children. Uh, in your estimation, how much of resources is necessary uh, to support a child with special needs, uh, regardless of the type? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what I would like to say about uh, funding for children with uh, disabilities in their schools is a challenge and will for a long time remain a challenge because um, the needs of each learner with disability varies and therefore the government tries as much as, pos as, much as possible to give capitation mm -hmm. but at some point parents need to come in and um, substitute because each learner requires a certain amount because they are different because here we look at individual needs of each learner so we cannot be able to say in a blanket and say mm -hmm. let's say 300 shillings will be able to take this child from this level to this level yeah y yet grace we yeah. see that um the capitation for uh, the 2016 or 17 financial year i believe mercy was that uh, 2000 shillings was uh, allocated every child regardless of the need Okay, thank you. As my colleague has said, the 2000 that was allocated may look like uh, it's sufficient, but again, we also go to back uh, to the special needs and the individual needs. Mm -hmm. There are those who may use the 2000, there are those who may require even more, depending mm -hmm. with their requirements. Mm -hmm. There are some who may require medication, mm -hmm. and there are some who are, majority of them are epileptic. And uh, they may require that medication, which sometimes the school has to provide. Mm -hmm. There are those who may require even less than that. But as we are saying, the government is doing something. But we're also calling upon parents. Let them not leave the whole burden to the government and the schools, mm -hmm. because they also support the other children. Mm -hmm. So if only awareness is created that we have parents coming out and say, probably they provide the basics that these children need, then the, whatever is being provided by the government mm -hmm. now can be used for the other resources. Mm -hmm. But by saying that doesn't mean that uh, the government may no, cannot give more. Mm -hmm. We're also saying that uh, if need be, maybe the government can allocate slightly more and for particular schools, specifically, like the case you have just presented that is on children who are deaf blind, only the, that's a combination or a multiple disability, right. and their needs are more. Mm -hmm. So well, it all depends. So Masi, mm -hmm. uh, Jambi mm -hmm. and Dr. Ongera here say that uh, the government is doing something, but uh, from what you experienced on location, mm -hmm. uh, how much more is required and are you able to quantify it? Is it in terms of resources or even uh, the teachers teaching there or even people who to care for these children? Or is it just a cultural issue affecting the parents? I think it's everything combined, Gituku. One of the sound bites of the parents that we talked to, she was really requesting the people who involved, and these are probably big fish in government, mm -hmm. Ministry of Education, in terms of people who can probably say that a certain amount be directed more to such schools, mm -hmm. do site visits. Mm -hmm. Because even when we were going to Cabernet School for the Deaf Blind, mm -hmm. what we saw on the ground was mm -hmm. not what we had in our minds. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a difference when you go to the ground and see what the children are going through. Mm -hmm. It's true that um, it's 2,000 per, per, per child, right. but it's, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. In fact, while the principal was telling us they had to do their own calculation in a year, mm -hmm. a deaf-blind student would need at least 200,000, mm -hmm. and that's on the lower side. Mm -hmm. She mentioned rightly that most of them are epileptic. Gituku, in a, in, a, in a span that the funds are delayed by government to right. reach the children, right. the teachers know that if the children are worse off, the burden falls with them. Mm -hmm. They have to go to their pockets, contribute among themselves to make sure that the children get medicine. Right. Gituku, just speaking to one of the parents, and I don't think that you should get a special child to fight passionately about them. That. We, when it's on your doorstep or when you're able to walk a mile in their shoes, right. that's when you fight the hardest, like one of the parents. Mm -hmm. But uh, Gituku, the school is doing a lot. Mm -hmm. for just from the parents, one of the students was walking backwards when he was brought in, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. He's now able to walk in a proper manner, feed himself. Mm -hmm. So you can only imagine the importance of, of having such schools. But from where we sit, from the site visits, from visiting the schools and just talking to the... I don't think enough is being done. Mm -hmm. I think there's an importance of an audit to be done. If the funding is reaching the school, 
right. and what happens in between. About mm. uh, uh, children with special needs. And Grace, we had just been talking about um, uh, this very unique situation of de deafblind uh, students. Mm. And from the Kenya Institute of, uh, Institute of Special Education, um, are you able to quantify, because we understand that 10% of uh, uh, the population in Kenya is, uh, uh, they have a certain level of disability, but are you able to quantify uh, for the school-going children, those that need primary care basically, um, between 0 and 18 years. Are you able to tell how many we are talking about and maybe after that you can now tell us the actual needs that need to be addressed by special needs uh, handlers. Yes, as a Kenya Institute of Special Education, we carried a national survey last year and uh, we were able to come up with figures showing different categories of learners with special needs and uh, most of those were in schools we also went ahead and trying to establish those who are not yet in schools. Mm -hmm. And this, by, we, through this information, we gave it to the Minister of Education. And from that, they are able to now come up with correct figures. And from others, also organizations that have also done surveys. Mm -hmm. Now they're trying to put all those data together to come up with actual mm -hmm. figures that in future will help, that uh, they are able now to budget and plan properly for these learners. And if you look at uh, the policy that was launched last, uh, that is May 25th by the president himself on special needs, they have brought up issues that are talking about the financing and the budgeting for these mm -hmm. learners with special needs. And we have seen a step ahead from that policy, mm -hmm. that now they are prepared even may become the next financial year, they may be prepared even to do more for them. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, we are saying, we may still not have full information because even as we were doing that survey, you realize their parents were still hiding their children. So, so meaning, mm, you, you are mm, saying that mm, the government as mm, currently constituted yes. does not have official information of how many learners we need to be targeting? No, they have data from the survey we carried out that says as an institute, other organizations have also carried out survey, but we're still saying that data can really help the government to budget for the learners, but it's still an estimate. We're yet to get the actual, so particularly the for these learners who are at home, the children who are not yet in schools. What is the mm -hmm. estimate? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, around 11% of children who are between the age of 3 and 21 have got uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. That is just an estimate. Right. And what we are saying is that there is no uh, data. There is data only that it is not reliable. Mm -hmm. Because for us to be able to uh, give proper services, mm -hmm. data has to be reliable. Mm -hmm. so that we know that if it's children who have got uh, deaf blind how many do we have in the country and where are they specifically so that even the funds or the services are directed towards that um, uh, place well, yeah. it, it appears difficult uh, to get the actual number of uh, children that you're talking about but for, uh, I'll base my calculation on what you just said that 11 percent of those people who are between 3 and 21 mm -hmm. uh, so this you might term them as the school going age but uh, between 0 and 19 years in the kenyan population you have about 24 million kenyans and if you're saying that uh, 10 percent of those are supposed to be disabled then you're talking about 2.4 million kenyans uh, can be a 2.4 million kenyans should be persons or children uh, between 0 and 19 uh, with disability from your experience you are telling us that in your story that uh, 2,800 schools received money for 106,000 learners then versus 2.4 million, a possible 2.4 million learners. Were these children? Were they not in school? In fact, uh, Gituku, the principal, um, he had power letting us into the school and telling us as it is was partly because they've lost a lot of children. Just by the mere fact that if it's half term or end December holidays, the numbers that go do not come back. Mm -hmm. In fact, by the time we were doing the story, there were supposed to be 74, but uh, around 56 had reported to school. First, because even if government uh, uh, sends some money to the schools, it's the parents who cater for the transportation of the children from the homes to the schools. Mm -hmm. That is not catered for. But remember again, a percentage of the 10% and the 11%, majority are from rural areas. Mm -hmm. One saddening bit, uh, Gituk, is partly because of the numbers that are not available, is because they hide them in the houses, that means they don't get medication, food, they end up dying. The principal saying in confidence in, in, with authority that if they don't come back after three terms, four, by the time they locate them, they're dead. It's mm -hmm. as serious as it is, Gituku. Mm -hmm. They don't make it. But and, uh, one of the teachers was telling us, one of the students, they tried looking for them 
only to be found in a shamba somewhere being used as a scarecrow oh, no. because the parents don't know what to use them for when they are at home. It's, it's a tricky balance. Mm -hmm. But that's the reason why there are no exact numbers. Okay. They are being hidden by government. Even when they come to school, it's not a fairy tale story. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, right. And, and Grace, as the head of department yes. of intellectual disability, and hearing that story of uh, children being used as scarecrow in, in, in farms, mm -hmm. uh, what are the actual? Because at, at the end of the day, it may be because parents do not know what they can do with that child. They do not know that they there exist opportunities for them. Yeah. So, from the intellectual disability point of view, how do you help these children? And how can parents know that actually there are certain opportunities? Well, thank you. What we have done as an institute, we have an assessment center, and they have organized outreach activities mm -hmm. where they go to the rural areas and they actually carry out assessment of the student. At the same time, they create awareness to enable parents within certain areas understand that there are schools that can cater for the student. Our institute, that particular department of assessment, have gone around almost in all the counties, and. Okay, well, that is the bit we have done. We know it's not enough, but we are still trying to do more through the teachers we train. Mm -hmm. We also encourage them. As they go back to their schools or their areas, they should also create awareness to the parents to understand mm -hmm. that there is m uh, something that can be done for the student. Currently, Kisa, we have two programs. We have teachers who train on full-time basis. We have also teachers who train during the holidays. And particularly, that's a big number. Mm -hmm. And we reach out to them even when we are what doing. What are the numbers? Uh, currently, we our uh, deputy director is, is she's in charge of distant learning. Mm -hmm. She is able to give us the actual figures. No, no, would mm. you know the number of mm. uh, teachers who have this capability to train mm. uh, children with special needs? Yes, um, I may not say the exact number, but mm -hmm. since its inception in the year 1986, mm -hmm. Kenya Institute of Special Education has been churning out um, graduates mm -hmm. uh, who do a diploma and uh, certificate courses. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, in the area of deaf blind, we have trained over 40 teachers because there are no many children with deaf blind because we train in relation to the area of uh, disability. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there are so many teachers outside there. Actually, there are over 20,000 teachers who are trained, over 20,000 actually. I'm mm -hmm. just, actually that is a very small number. Over mm -hmm. 50,000 mm -hmm. teachers who have mm -hmm. been trained on distance, in, yeah. in the area of special needs. And they're working with the government. And they're working with the government. They're mm -hmm. working under Teacher Service Commission. They're mm -hmm. in the schools out there. Mm -hmm. Even the teachers who are in um, um, the school for the deaf blind that you've shown there, uh, Cabranet, mm -hmm. there are teachers there, actually most of the teachers there are trained in the area of special needs. So they identify these learners and they even, um, actually in Cabranet School for the Deaf, we have an assessment center. The assessment centers are run by the Ministry of uh, Education in conjunction with the Asia Service Commission. And they identify these children, they bring them forward, they have them assessed and they place them in schools. And even parents are encouraged through the outreach programs that we are talking about, which mm -hmm. are carried out not only by the KISA staff but also by the assessment teachers. When they identify these children, they refer them to schools and those ones who are not assessed, they take them on board, they assess them and then they place them where they can get appropriate um, services. A and so for someone who is watching, they have, uh, let's say, a deafblind child or they know someone who has a deafblind uh, deaf child rather, um, what are the programs that you, what is the training like, what is the curriculum like for that special category of children? Uh, first of all, we have two curriculum. We have a curri the, the new curriculum and we have the old curriculum. Uh, for now, if I can talk about the old curriculum, we have specialist curricula for special schools. Like you'll find learners with deaf blind have got their own curriculum which they go through. Um, you just saw there and we've been told that some children come to school when they don't have the basic skills. But in school they are trained like using a curriculum for subjects like activities of daily living, orientation and mobility, which are not in the regular curriculum. So mm -hmm. we have curricula specific for specific needs. We have curriculum for learners who have got autism. I'm sure many people don't even understand what autism is. Um, we have curriculum for learners who are deaf, where they are taught extra subjects such as communication, mm -hmm. speech training, um, uh, audiology, and things like that. Mm -hmm. We have a special curriculum for learners who have got mental disability, mm -hmm. where they are trained specific subjects 
to their specific needs subjects like activities of daily living perceptual training so that they can be able to learn more so we have curricula and now with the new curriculum they have designed a curriculum which is going to give specific training to these learners alongside other learners so that they can be able to exploit their potential so that they can be able to achieve mm -hmm. um, to their potential. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. and Masikandia, while you are there, do you think um, something will be done? I think there is hope, first of all, from the students who've gone through the school with its challenges and are able to go about, they've been employed in the school, being paid 6,000, though it's little, but they feel they've been ac they're accomplished in life. A deaf-blind student was washing clothes, trying to take the other students around. There is hope. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, more should be done. For example, just the curriculum that you've talked about, mm -hmm. one of the classrooms in the evening, as part of the curriculum, should have toys, music, mm -hmm. to, you know, do something with the sen sensors and all, but it's empty. So they just sit and they just sit. It's, it's empty. So, yeah, maybe a mm -hmm. lot more should be done well, to make them independent. Clearly so much more, so much more to be done, so much yeah. more to talk about, but unfortunately we have to cross over to Parliament because uh, the leaders that have been invited are already there, but just to thank you